Okay. Well, hi, Tammy. Hi, Dr. Rob. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's Dr. Rob Weiss. I'm glad to be here. A little bit tired. I have been um, in Singapore and Tokyo and overseas doing some training, which is really fun. And I have to tell you, there are sex addicts all over the world. I, uh, I went to Singapore and met with a, a group of partners. There were 18 partners in Singapore, all of whom were working on pro-dependence and trying to heal the wounds of betrayal. And it was a really beautiful thing to sit with them um, and do that work over there. Um, and hopefully, I'll, you know, and by the way, they all said hi, because they come here, Tammy, and they listen and they go to, the, they go to all this stuff. It's just so strange to walk, be on the other side of the world and be speaking the same language. It's a really wonderful thing. So hi, everybody. I'm, I'm a little tired, but I'm here. You are here, and that's good. I'm sort of four in the morning, you know, but I think I'm here. Um, so this is, first question is, does sex unprotected even feel that good, or has porn amplified the act? Well, I think sex always feels good, but if you are really having problems with looking at a lot of porn, sex is not as good and not as exciting, because you kind of get numb. Your brain gets kind of numb from all that porn. And I don't really think protected or unprotected is the issue. Um, if you're looking at a lot of porn, you're going to be numb to intimate sexuality because you're all uh, sort of focused your energy on all that, um, all the stuff you're seeing in the porn. So yes, that should answer that. Does it, you want to add to that one? Well, I was going to say that that's the only question right now. So you know, do you want well, to let's talk tell a people what we're doing? We well, yes, because you never know who's here. So Tammy yeah. and I are here every week, uh, answering questions about sex, love, and addiction. They're recorded, but you don't talk and we don't see you and we don't know who you are. So we're just recording a series of anonymous questions. We do this every week because we get to give away free time and offer you folks help and support. The people who go through our treatment programs at 10 here every week, some of them are listening tonight. Hi guys, I will see you on Wednesday, I think. And uh, people who've been through our programs at four at 10, people who are uh, um, thinking about, uh, who've read some of my books or it just, Lots of folks show up here, and all we do is answer questions. That's it. So if you don't ask questions, we don't have anything to do. Um, Tammy and I have been doing this for what a year and a half, something like that. And as Tam, yeah, I was gonna say at least. I think even earlier than that, but yeah. And then as Tammy said, all of these are recorded and left on our website. So if there's some, if you hear something like, you know, I asked that question, I wish my wife had heard that. Well, you can go back and find it. That's why we leave it, or vice versa. Um, most of what we answer here are questions about sex addiction, love addiction, intimacy disorders, disclosure, um, finding therapy, finding treatment, uh, what is addiction, what is porn addiction, all of those things. And um, we're glad to answer those. I'm not going to do a heavy uh, duty introduction of me, but I will say if you want to know more about me or what this is all about, just go to seekingintegrity.com and you can find out anything you want. Um, who we are, why we're doing this, all of that. But for those of you who are new, this is a volunteer thing that we do. This website, sexandrelationshiphealing.com, has 14 groups a week that are on here for free. And we just got a note from a bunch of people saying how grateful they were that we were doing them. So here we are. Um, Tammy, I have patterned us into three questions. That's a <laughs> so, good thing. So yes. Why don't you so get, uh, the first is a continuation. It's more than I've had protected sex and haven't enjoyed it. So unprotected sex must feel better. So thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't think that's the issue. I mean, it might feel a little bit better, but that's not the issue. Um, no offense, but, and if you want to try a protected sex versus unprotected sex, you can do that in masturbation. You can masturbate yourself with a condom and then without. And, or if you're a woman, you can masturbate with some kind of protection without, and you can decide if there's a big difference. But my experience is if you're here and you're asking questions of us, then probably the issue has more to do with the amount of porn you're looking at, which usually tends to numb out your feelings of healthy sexuality when you're with people. Some people don't get erections altogether or lose their ability to get aroused because they look at so much porn uh, that real time regular folks just aren't that interesting to them. And so it's a challenge across the board for those people who struggle with it. But I don't think a little bit more physical feeling or less physical feeling is probably what this is about. In fact, I would suggest that most of us put a little bit too much energy into about, oh, I don't know, maybe a, a quarter of a square inch of our ability to physically feel things, uh, meaning our sexual parts. And there are so many other places that we can have feeling come from than that, especially during sex. So yeah, I would say you're probably miss, not firing on all cylinders overall related to sex, if you're asking that question. Well, and I was thinking, I wonder if it's, I'm uncomfortable with the intimacy of sex versus porn. It makes it 
scarier? I don't know, but that was a thought that came to me. Well, a lot of people will say that, you know, I mean, being with a person is scarier. Porn will never let you down. Porn will never disappoint you. Porn will never uh, um, turn you down for a second date. But but people, you know, they can they have feelings and they have smells and they have moods and you know they're just not as predictable as porn. And sometimes that can be a real turn on. But if you're not used to it, it can be a real turn off. Um, and you kind of have to adapt. And it sounds strange to those of us who didn't go through this, but you may have to adapt to having sex with people and kind of wean yourself off the porn because the sex with porn has become too familiar and what comes naturally ain't coming naturally. So, and I don't mean to be, you know, uh, joking about this. These are real things and real problems, but uh, the answers are true. Okay. So, um, uh, so yes. something in the, um, well, I'm trying to decide which one to go with. So I'm No, I just want to, can I tell you, tell me that I, yeah. I'm looking out the window at this view. And so I keep thinking, it's well, absolutely I to, gorgeous. I need to turn this so that, but the truth is I'm not really looking out the window at the view. That is a picture. So yes. that is the view. Anyway, I'm fine. Go ahead. Yes. And you're actually looking at the view. So keep looking at your screen. You're fine. But I'm, okay. I'm confused. All good. I okay. screwed up and had a series of affairs, but I don't feel like an addict. I made bad mistakes. So I'm, am I in denial? Well, that's kind of a, that's a difficult question to answer without more information. So, you know, if you say, and you might describe the nature of the mistakes you made, that would be helpful. But let me say something about cheating. If that, that's a common mistake that people make in relationships. So, you know, if you cheat once, maybe even the second time, and you see what that does to someone you love, or they find out, or they break up with you, or whatever it is, that's called a lesson. That's an opportunity to learn things. If what you learn from cheating is, and getting caught is, I need to do a better job of hiding my cheating. You have not learned the lesson. So the lesson of cheating, when you see that broken hearted person in front of you who just found out is, oh, when I cheat, that's really immature of me because I'm not thinking about how that's gonna affect someone else. I'm just thinking about myself. So people who cheat once or twice and then see how it affects someone they care about or it affects them by losing that person generally learn from that experience and think, wow, I think cheating is a problem when you really love someone. I'm going to live differently. But people who choose to just keep cheating only try to do it better, that more borders on addict because why aren't you learning from your mistakes? Why are you continuing to let people down and hurt yourself and hurt others if you already know that you're not going to get away with cheating. So I can't tell you whether you're an addict or not, but I can say that one of the symptoms of addiction is returning to a behavior despite having had bad consequences related. So if I had a DUI from drinking and I got in trouble for drinking and driving, I would probably not drink and drive again ever unless I was an alcoholic, in which case I'd get right back in my car and pick a different street. So I can't answer the question for you. You know yourself you know yourself better than we do, but I'm trying to give you some clues because addiction doesn't just happen once or twice. It's a pattern that occurs over and over and over again. Okay, I'm going to tag in on that. It's Please like, do. We talk about intimacy disorder and, you know, and affairs are the dopamine rush and they're the for, you know, forbidden and all of that type of thing. But, you know, if you're in a relationship and there's expectations on that I'm with you and you're with me and that's all there is, you know, it isn't an open relationship then, you know, that there's, it's negative consequences. Not that you just got caught, that you're hurting someone else that you, you know, that you apparently don't care you know, about that person. And I, I have been on the phone with multiple partners just today, again, who are talking about, you know, how hurtful it is if they don't care that they'll keep doing this behavior. And I explained that an addict, that's how it is. I'm compartmentalized that it doesn't really hurt them while the key clicking was, it was challenging. Sorry. But, Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. But it's, it's I'm the, the, I had taking notes. okay. But that, your behavior is compartmentalized in the, I'm just doing this, I'm doing what I want. It doesn't really matter to these other people, but it does. So it's right. getting, if, if getting caught is the only negative consequence and you're not thinking the negative consequence is I've betrayed this person that I'm supposed to be in a relationship right. with, trust me, that's a negative consequence. So. so you're simply saying, Tammy, the fact that you hurt somebody it's not that just that you screwed up a relationship or you ended up alone or you, 
missed an opportunity is that someone is walking around hurt from what you did. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so this person tags on, this is my second time getting caught and I'm working hard, you know, that this not to keep doing it. Uh, I don't know if the marriage will continue, but I'm going to try. And, you know, and my or more question is, why didn't you learn the first time? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So uh, next question. My husband has been in recovery for almost a year. We've been living separately and are starting to think about moving back in together. What are some rules or things to consider before moving back in together? Well, let me see. I want to see the question. Um, I think when you have been apart, it's important to start dating again. I don't think that it's a, it makes sense to just sort of move in without having to spend a lot of time getting to know each other and really working on the relationship. So it depends on how much time you've been spending working together. Um, my bottom line rule is honesty. I mean, that's the bottom line is that whoever is moving in with whoever, there can't be any more lies. Um, there just can't because taking that ride into living together again is such a huge risk. And um, I'm sure you haven't taken it lightly if you took a year to make that decision. And um, what I would be looking for now is, do I feel like I'm getting an honest answer in my Do I feel like I'm, what I'm seeing is what I'm getting? Do I feel this person is being honest and committed to both me and healing? Um, you know, do I feel safe and comfortable in ways I didn't feel safe and comfortable before? Some of this depends on how you feel. Some of it depends on what you see. Um, and, you know, love is love. And if you still are deeply attached, you're probably going to try it again. But, but the most, and that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. But the most important thing is, especially for the addict to realize is that this is your last chance. You don't get another one. Somebody is willing to try with you again. That's amazing. Don't screw it up. And what I mean is you don't have to be perfect. You might masturbate. You might look at porn. I don't know, but you better tell that spouse because you're leaving him or her in the dark is a setup to be living alone again. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, you've talked about, talked about dating and how, you know, how you can do that. I, I think, you know, it's like dating again. What, what are the steps you take before moving in together? Initially, what are the steps you take? And so, so looking at all those, but I a hundred percent agree that if there isn't trust, you know, it ain't gonna work, so. Okay, next question. I am eight, uh, 18 months into recovery as an SA. My question is, I acted out for 30 years of my marriage with women who were friends or acquaintance, acquaintances of my wife. I kept it very close to our home. Is mm -hmm. this because of my mother neglected me or because I was molested as a child? What would be the reason for me to act out this way? Um, I am not really sure why it matters on some level. And I don't mean to, and I know that I've talked about this before, that when I work with somebody and I really feel in working with them, what the limits of their addiction were, like they did all their acting out near home or they only acted out when they were on the road and didn't bring it anywhere near home. And when I'm working with someone like that, I can begin to feel the shadows, if you will, of their injuries and their abuse because when we go into secrecy and hiding and do our acting out in some ways, we're imitating that history. But if I'm not working with you directly, I, I can't really tell what the meaning of it is. I do think it's worthwhile you're noting, noticing, oh, look how I acted out. Isn't it interesting that I did it in this way? And at 18 months, I would be more focused on how I can be absolutely sure that every single door is closed and that it remains closed so that I can be safe and keep my partner safe. Um, what it means, I mean, you know, I guess, I don't know, I could tell you 10 different things. And I wonder if that would really matter all that much. And I don't mean that our histories don't matter and they're not important to us. But I, I can tell you that a lot of what happened to me uh, that left me as messed up as I am, uh, it happened before I could remember. I mean, I was three and four and five when a lot of the things happened to me. So, you know, I, I know what some of them were. I don't remember them. Does it matter? You know, there used to be a lot in therapy, a lot of I, an idea that if you uncovered what happened to you and then you kind of examined it and worked through it and explored it and then exploded it and cried over it, whatever, that somehow life would all be better. And we sort of learned from that time. I don't think that we look at the past quite in that way. It's useful as a source of being less ashamed, um, predicting when I might act out, keeping myself safe. But in terms of, you know, um, psychology, you know, some things probably happen and you ended up like this. <laughs> and whether you know more or you know less, it probably won't help you either way to recover. So 
Um, I think that's a good question for you to talk about in therapy if you're in the kind of therapy where that would be explored. Oh, the next one is more of a comment. In a drop-in group, I was told by a moderator several things that felt sort of harsh, but maybe are true. As I remember, they were sort of a, as follows. I have a defeatist attitude. I lack willingness. And there's, so uh, my, my comments to those are that it, without willingness, I can't make any progress. So for me, um, the key to recovery has been being willing. Well, and let me respond to this. Just like this group, all of our groups are volunteer only. We're not, um, oh, there's more to this question. Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> he has more, or she. Oh, the question continued. Oh, um, oh, I see down, oh, okay. I see it, it skipped. They all felt damning and demotivating. I admit being very discouraged with life in general and being resistant to programs and commitment. But what could have been said to help me and what can I do to stay motivated even a little bit? Okay, thank you for pointing that there's more, so. Well, I think you are motivated, you wouldn't be here. I mean, if you were unmotivated, you would say screw the whole thing and you wouldn't be here. So you're still motivated. And what was said to you on this platform by someone who was involved in this platform didn't upset you so much or wasn't so far off the mark that you said, I don't wanna be around this space anymore. So, you know, again, we are not paid to do this. This is all volunteer. Some of us are licensed professional therapists. Some of us are recovering people. You know, so I would say take what you like and leave the rest. That is really the best idea. But if something stuck with you, and it sounds like this did, I might pay attention to that. You know, it's funny when someone says to me, and people do, oh, Rob, you're just this, that, and the other thing. If it doesn't stick, I, I might think, well, what the heck were they thinking? But I don't feel bad about it. When someone says something that kind of sticks in my head, even that really pissed off about it, it's usually because there's some measure of truth in it. And you've already said that. So my statement to you would be, how can you begin to react less emotionally to terms like being defeatist and lacking willingness? So the fuck what? You're defeatist and you lack willingness. Well, get to work. You know, it's like someone called you on it. Good for them. You have people in your life who might notice in coming to these spaces, that there are other things you can do to get better. Listen to them. If you take this personally or are insulted by it or are ashamed by it, there's no growth there. I want everyone to hear that. Shame, there's no growth there. I, I'm definitely a guy who used to walk around with my head in my navel. It's because I hated myself so much. I just didn't want to look at the world. And all I looked at was how horrible I was. When anything went bad, it was because I was a bad person. I was unlovable, all of that. And without growing past that, you're, this is a perfect example of why you have to go past that. Because let's say you are someone who can be a little defeatist and maybe you lack a little willingness and someone called you on it. If your response is to say, I'm a horrible person, that makes me feel like a failure, I hate that they said that, I, 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 this is awful. You know, if you go into a place of being wounded by that, then you don't grow. And the whole purpose of all of this is to grow. So if someone calls you on something in one of these spaces, if it doesn't stick at all, it probably won't bother you because it's probably about them. But if they say something that sticks with you, it probably has meaning. And that would be where I'd consider you to be motivated because you are now motivated to figure this out, but for the wrong reasons. It's not important why this upset you. It's not important what that person said. What's important is, is there something you could do to be more motivated and more committed? Because there's something here for you. There's a lesson to be learned. So, um, um, yeah, let me, uh, so all I'm saying to you is um, what I've said three times, right? Which is if you heard something useful to you, act on it. Don't get, don't get all weird about why did they say that? And what does it mean? Just take an action rather than, an, uh, than be offended. Tammy, do you have any? No. Yeah, no, I do actually. Cause I was, I was sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, how many times I got called on the tw in 12 step meetings. And you know, I remember going, oh, they don't understand and like drama, drama, drama. And then, but, but that's the stuff that I actually still remember. Those were the pivotal moments in my program where I was like, mm -hmm. oh, 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 I get it. And so that, that was super helpful for me. And I appreciated that they were brave enough to say something. So, you know, that's the, you know, that's the point of all of this is that we can support each other and support doesn't mean just going, oh, you're doing great. Oh, you're doing great. It's like, you know, have you considered or usually 
for me, you know, if I say, you know, I found for myself that da, 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 you know, I can, you know, if I say it from my personal experience, I'm just sharing my experience. You can take okay. it or leave it. I have an idea for you also. Yeah. Um, not for you. Oh, no offense, but for this person, um, I would take those words, uh, defeatist and whatever else they said. And I would ask some really close friends, people, nothing to do with this space, but people in your life, your spouse, your friends, your family, your therapist, say that, you know, you've gotten some information, some feedback. People said you were this and that. What do they think? Because people who know you better than us, they're going to see these things too. Maybe they're afraid to say it or they never really found quite the way to say it. Maybe a stranger found an easier way to say something that's been on the mind of someone who loves you a while. So here's a great opportunity to grow. Bring it to the people you care about and, and be open to the answer. So he continues, I'm not disagreeing, but this, <laughs> this is a pattern which is extremely difficult to change. How do you grow past it? What are some baby steps that I can take to grow past that? I think that's a great question. Well, I, I think we're talking about them. I think number one, you've already taken one by coming back here and asking about it. Mm -hmm. To me, that says you're already willing. Um, if you have a problem with a lot of what I would call narcissistic reactivity, meaning you take things very personally, you feel easily wounded, if you are that person, if it's not just these issues, but in general, that's something you see a therapist about for sure, because if you react to, if you're, if when I was very reactive, I couldn't learn. I was so busy protecting myself from the bad things people were saying to me that I couldn't learn from the parts that were useful. And so I think that's maybe the more important lesson for you here is, it, is are you able to hear these things and sit with them long enough to grow and learn? It sounds like you're getting to be that person. So it sounds like you're on that road. And baby steps, I think I gave you one. Take some of the actual content that you felt uncomfortable with, the actual words, and go to people in your life that you really care about and say, can you tell me in a gentle way, do you see this in me and how? That would be being intimate, vulnerable, and open to learning. And I'm glad you're here. Me too. The other thing that I came up with, I, I have, have a hard time being defeatist if I'm grateful. And I've shared this before. One of the first lessons I learned, and I still practice it now, is gratitude. And if I have gratitude, if, I, if I'm thinking three things that I'm grateful for today, I'm not thinking that the whole world is falling apart and, you know, that everything is awful and I'm not feeling defeatist because I've got gratitude for some, something that I deem to be good in my life. So, so anything that I can do that is a positive thing helps me not focus on the negative. I would also add that there's defeatist and hopeless are very close to each other. And, you know, you could also be someone who's a little depressed, who's feeling like I've tried this, it's not going to work. I've tried that, it's not going to work. I'm kind of, you know, being like that could be more about uh, emotional stuff than, you know, what someone calls defeatist, you might call hopelessness. What someone else calls defeatist, you might call, um, you know, I've given up. So, you know, you might want to look at that um, and, you know, your, your general emotional state. And are you generally in a place of, I can't handle this, I'm overwhelmed by this, I, you know, that kind of stuff. There may be some work for you to do. Or, you know, a good psychiatric evaluation to find out if there's clinical depression. So Depression and shame, very familiar, similar feelings. Yeah. Okay, next question. I have greatly benefited from the support network you've created. It's impressive and appreciated. When should a betrayed partner expect SA who is in treatment to show sincere remorse and make restoring marriage a priority? <laughs> I'm sorry I laughed. Why did I laugh, Tammy? <laughs> because when should and a time frame. So. Well, I mean, if you've been betrayed and hurt by someone that and genuine, you love. genuine, sincere. And so. <laughs> Um, probably six months to a year. Um, someone's immediate response to being found out is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it, and will you forgive me? And usually they have that response within about a minute and a half of getting in trouble. The hardest thing in the world for someone who's hurt another person is to sit with, if, you, if they really love you, to sit with the fact that you're not ready yet to forgive, you haven't moved. Your audio just cut out. You're muted, unmute. I muted myself, but I didn't mean to. I was trying to read the question. Um, so the other thing is what Tammy was saying is about timing. You know, 
in the first six months of the work, we're so focused on trying to figure out what happened to us and what we did and what is, you know, we're getting to empathy is, is really a later stage. And so when you say genuine, um, that can take a long time. Um, empathy is a, a, takes a while. Um, let me say this. I wrote a book about this. I wrote a book because I called Out of the Doghouse, uh, a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating. And I wrote the book because most of the men I've worked with over 20 years, and that's probably a thousand, I've not met one heterosexual man who innately knew how to truly apologize and make amends for having uh, betrayed a loving partner. And it's not that we as men don't want to apologize or want to make it right. Sometimes we don't fully understand the amount of pain we've caused. In fact, I would say the whole sex addiction field in general didn't get partners for a very long time, probably the first 15 or 20 years of our work, because the whole field was dominated by male sex addicts. And it took women being much more involved in the process for understand, us to understand the pain that partners go through and the amount of time that it takes. So um, I did write a book about this. I would say read Doghouse. It will give you stages. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I often have spouses, Tammy and I both do, who will say partners, often female, who will say, you know, after what he did to me, and now that he knows how much he hurt, you think you would think he would be nicer. He'd be more generous, more kind, more available, more love, you know. And here's the thing, you know, we can stop acting out and learn how to stop acting out slowly, but learning how to be a kind, compassionate, empathic, non-narcissistic husband or wife, that could take a while. Learning how to be a better person can take a while. Learning how to not hurt you, that's something we can do pretty quickly, but being compassionate, empathic, loving, a lot of us never had that. That's part of why we have the problem ourselves. And it's really hard for us to give, it, give to you something that we don't know, we don't really understand. So, um, and again, Doghouse is written for men to read and say, oh my God, that's what being compassionate looks like. And, that's, and then they throw the book down because they're mad and they don't want to do it, but that's what it is. I just typed that in the chat for those of you that want to take a look at that too. Next question. Please describe the purpose of a therapeutic disclosure for the addict and the betrayed spouse. I feel it must be more than just knowing what the acting out timeline was. Do you think this is a spouse or, a, or an addict? This is, is, a, this is a, a, from a spouse. So, How did I know that, Tammy? <laughs> and I did, but how did I know that was a spouse? Go ahead. You have to ask. Why don't you answer the question first? Because because spouses are far more um, wanting to have a disclosure. But and and spouses ahead. are often not satisfied with the disclosure they get, feeling that they need more data, more information, more data points, more details, and all of that. Um, Correct. And I had another one today where they talked about the vomit disclosure, where it was just like everything was said. And it's unfortunate because now it's trying to make repairs. So, so let me let me say a little bit about disclosure. Um, somewhere in the last twenty five years of doing this work, those of us who've been doing it for a while realized that partners were being left in the dark in ways that wasn't helpful. It wasn't simply that they wanted to know what had happened in their relationship. It was they were trying to figure out, you know, uh, what was the depth of the problem, what was the degree. They really, we felt in the field that. If your goal is to return to a partnership or have a partnership that's truly equal, where each side feels balanced and fair, that, that you could never restart or start a relationship with such an, un, an unequal playing ground as one of you knowing that all this stuff has happened and one of you not knowing. And we also have learned that, that trust is very difficult to restore when one partner has no idea what the nature of the problem has been, and for many, many more reasons. And so we started the process of doing disclosure and we've done research about it. There's books about it, all kinds of stuff. The reality is that for couples that are desirous to go forward, it's really important for the spouse to know how many people you've been sexual with, over what period of time were you sexual? Um, was it people you knew or she knew or he knew or were they strangers? Did you pay for it? Um, did it happen uh, while you were on your honeymoon or any significant events. Um, those are the kinds of things. How many times, how often, um, was it safe? Was it with anyone I knew? Those kinds of questions we feel need to be on the table so that there's some equal playing field. What we don't think it's useful to get into is the graphic details of sex. How big were her this and that's? How many times did you go into that part? We just don't talk about that. If you're gonna stay together, it doesn't make sense 
and it and we've seen it not make sense partners will get an image in their head of what that sex was like it's very hard to ever really be with someone again when you can picture the graphic details in your mind of the very trauma that is hurting you so general things yes and and what i find for partners interestingly i've had many partners oh my husband's a sex addict my wife's a sex addict oh they've done these terrible things to me but what they didn't get before the disclosure was really how sick we are. <laughs> and I mean that, you know, you're feeling as partners betrayed, violated, hurt. It's kind of like cheating only worse because we have a problem and you don't even know what it means. But there's something about hearing, you've been to 35 sex workers over the past two years. You spent $3,000. You were in a uh, massage parlor when I was giving birth. There's something about hearing the graphic details of that, not the graphic sexual details, but the nature of it. I've seen spouses say things like, whoa, you really are troubled. And in a way that's really important because then you as a spouse realize that it goes so far beyond you. It isn't about your body, your, you know, yes, it has affected you, but more importantly, when you see the, the amount, the kind of stuff that we're out there doing and probably did before we met you, you get to understand that we really have a problem that affects you deeply, but also exists independently of you. And that is a big piece of disclosure. Tammy, did you want to add anything? You know, I just highly recommend being well prepared. Both right. of you supported, have a plan. Um, I, I hate when I get the calls. That, yeah, you know, I, I told everything. And I thought, oh man, that poor partner just got, you know, it just got annihilated with all this trash and it's terrible. So, so ideally the, the couples that do a, a good job of he's pre the typical couple, he's the addict, she's the partner. He's prepared. He's done his timeline. He's quit the behavior. So it isn't like, well, I'm doing this now, but I'm not really in recovery. So I'm going to do another one three weeks from now and another one three mm -hmm. weeks from now. You know, that is, that's chaos. That's terrible. Um, uh, so ideally, you know, he's supported. He's doing a good timeline. She's supported, you know, and it, they have a plan. You know, those, the people that go through that, even if they don't stay together, you know, that's such a, a good grounding for everyone. So I think that's uh, that's the most helpful. They're glad they did it, you know, even though it's not fun. They're really glad they did it, and and like you said, Dr. Rob, it's like they've got this foundation of honesty that you know now it's an it's even the playing field. So, so that's you know that's what we can expect for a well done disclosure. So the next question: My husband is a sex addict. He has not watched porn or masturbated for over six weeks. He is seeing a therapist, and we are seeing a couples therapist. He attends SAA meetings and participates in other activities that help with treatment, such as your webinars. He has been working on not fantasizing about sex unless he is in a situation which is within our agree agreed upon boundaries. When he returns from work today, he reported that he did not think about sex or get aroused at all during his workday. He reported that being uh, uh, he reported that before becoming aware of his addiction and trying to get healthy, he would get aroused and think about sex several times every day. He is concerned that he is losing his sex drive. Is his decrease in thoughts of sex arousal a sign that he is becoming more healthy or he, is he right to be concerned about him losing his sex drive? So um, this person is a fairly newcomer for what I can see is fairly new. So this is a good, a very good question, but I think it's premature in the sense that um, I don't know who's, um, so I'm going to talk to you, Tammy. I'm not sure if this couple has a therapist or not, but I think it'd be really helpful for them to get more guidance because I would never think it's healthy for someone to come home to their wife or husband and report, sorry, my dog's barking, and report their sexual fantasies. Um, that's not healthy, that's not appropriate, and that's not what this is about. Um, your husband is going to have sexual fantasies. I hope so. He's a human being and he's alive. And if he's afraid to tell you about them, he may not, which means he's lying to you, but he's having them because he's human. The question is, what is your need to learn here about every single fantasy he has that doesn't help him? What does need to happen is that he does need to have bottom lines around his sexual behavior does he ask for someone's phone number? Does he go out with someone? Does he have sex with someone? Does he look at porn? Whatever those boundaries are, if he crosses one of those boundaries, yeah, you need to know if he's kind of fallen down and needs to pick himself back up 
but the day-to-day -day is up to him and a therapist, him and a, other people in 12-step programs. And I don't think that any spouse should be policing someone's sex life. Now, that's different. If you say, well, I want to know where he is, fine, get a GPS tracker and you can know where he is all day long. You'll see if he's at the office or home. Or home. But the nature of his thoughts and fantasies are going to be in his head. And, and, and it is not fair for you to ask him to tell you everything. What is fair and important is for you to say to him, if there's anything that I need to know about, like your bottom lines of this, 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 and this, please tell me. Um, otherwise, I would prefer he didn't tell you what he looked at and did during the day because it's only going to keep you constantly. So I'm going to try this a different way. Spouses, uh, you, you, spouses do detective work. It's what you do. It's part of being a brute betrayed spouse. Um, I write about this. I understand this. I think it's not because you want to break up and find that thing he did. I actually think it's you're looking to make sure that there's nothing new and you're actually looking to make sure there isn't new stuff. And that's great. But you should not be the detective to search down what's new. It's his job to tell you what's going on if something is deeply concerning. So um, let me look at the question again because it was long. Um, I don't believe that he's not fantasizing about sex. I think he is going to fantasize about sex in healthy situations when he sees an attractive person, and he should. So understand that recovery for this issue, and I've been working on this for 25 years, so I'm not just blowing smoke. It's not about avoiding sex or eliminating sex or, or pretending you don't have sexual feelings. It's not, not about that. It's about learning to tolerate and live with the same experiences that everybody has every day of the week, which is, oh, that person's attractive, that person is attractive. That's normal, that's human. Our problem is we act on it. So learning to tolerate those interests and not act on it is partially what it's all about. The other part is being much more honest and accountable to you if there is something that happens that would be considered a slip or um, him breaking his sobriety. Um, Tammy, I would wanna to talk to this person about what he or she is doing to get support for themselves. Because I know if I was sitting home waiting to hear the news from my partner about what they looked at today, I wouldn't be in a good place most days. Even, and, and one more thing, sorry. I understand that it feels good to get this information. I understand that you think and believe that you're, as a couple you are safer knowing what he's thinking about. But the truth is, is that he will never tell you the truth as long as he believes that you're looking over his shoulder every moment of the day, questioning his thoughts. If you want a lover that is kind and compassionate and honest with you, then you're gonna to have to build up the expectations for that honesty without demanding it in that way. Um, Tammy, thoughts? Feedback? Yeah, I had a, bu a bunch of them. Um, they're seeing a therapist, but I didn't hear, you know, I don't know if it's a qualified therapist. Trained. Yes, exactly. And same with the couples therapist. Um, glad he's attending SAA meetings. Hopefully he's getting a sponsor and doing that work. What I did pick up on too was the six weeks. That's a relatively short period of time. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know, but many therapists recommend a 90 day abstinence period. Um, and because it takes the brain some time to just kind of chill back out and recalibrate. So, so I'm thinking if it's only six weeks, I could see where things might be a little bit of a lull, et cetera. And that would not be so, I could be understand it being disconcerting, but that, that would probably be part of a fairly normal response. So, so, so getting qualified support with all this, a hundred percent with Dr. Rob though, you know, like that is, I don't want to know every single thought and fantasy. Well, so, and also Tammy, um, by the way, it says in the literature of several of the 12 step meetings, it's, and I'll quote on this, it, it, ta it can take years for the lust of the mind to drain away, meaning this constant lusting, that's going to be a while. But acting on it, that can happen right away. So, and, and if you said, if he said he lusted, I wouldn't want you to feel like he'd done something wrong. Maybe he did everything right. He was attracted to someone and kept walking. That's a good thing. One more thing, Tammy, this person said, and I want to note it, he or she said, uh, we have, uh, he or she said, my partner, the addict has a therapist and we have a couples therapist. I didn't see anything about what the spouse is doing for themselves. And I wanna to say to all you spouses, I understand that you think, well, after this person screwed me over, why the heck would I need to be in therapy? I didn't do anything wrong. And you're absolutely right, you didn't do anything wrong. But you have been affected by what's happened. 
you've been traumatized, you've been lied to, you've been gaslighted, you've been abused, you've been told black is blue and blue is green for years, and, or, you know, and now you're dealing with the aftermath of all that crap. That is why you need some support. Some of you spouses are so angry and understandably so at us for what we've done, but you need a place to take it other than us. We are, all, are dealing with our own stuff. And as much as we appreciate and value, I think, the fact that you still care enough about us to have feelings at all, um, there has to be a place for you, the spouse, to work out your rage, your frustration, your hurt um, with other women or men who have been betrayed. And that's why we offer free groups for this. So you can talk to other spouses and they can say, well, I don't ask him about that, but I do ask him about this. Or, and talk to other people in your situation so that you can get a better feel. You're not necessarily going to get the answers you want in your couple's therapy or in his or her individual. You need a place for you whether that's a group or some kind of therapist. Agree, and we do have betrayed partner groups and we've got male betrayed partner groups and we've got an old lady posse group. So there's lots of choices. Okay, next dog, question. If you see me moving around, by the way, it's, it's, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to keep my dog contained until he, he eats dinner. So uh, next question, my partner is not yet in treatment. How do I respond when I know he is lying to me? Respond in a positive way that is helpful, that is? You're muted, you're muted, unmute. I think when I press on the question that happens sometimes. Um, so I, I'm not sure about this question because I mean, when I, even if I have an addict, I come home and I say, um, um, I bought the groceries today. I'm probably not lying. So lying about what, lying in what ways, what truth would be expected? I, I, I think there's a lot more to this question. I'm not quite sure how to respond to it. Let's um, say they're still, they're in, not in treatment. So let's say they're lying about their acting out. I would assume that if someone's not getting help, that anything they say is pretty much not true. And I don't think you have to respond with a smile. I think you can say the truth, which is, I don't believe, I don't, after all this happened, I don't believe what you have to say. And I'm not sure that I'm ready to until you're getting some help. So why don't you just stop giving me excuses that I don't believe? Um, I don't think, why don't you not even tell me why you're home or where you've been until you're working on yourself. I'm acting like you know. Until you're working on yourself, I don't really care where you've been or what you're doing. That's up to you. I don't trust anything you say anyway. But when I see you going to some meetings, when I know that you've gone to a treatment center for a couple of weeks and come back, and now you've got some kind of plan for what to do and follow through. And by the way, when you go to treatment, when, when anybody goes to treatment, especially with us, you're going to get a plan. But the plan also goes to your spouse and your therapist. So everybody knows what the plan is. And my experience is what people most need when they get back is a plan to follow, and then they need to follow it. So, you know, what is your husband's plan right now or wife? What are they doing that would tell me they're in therapy or treatment? that's when I would begin to believe them. And you can use, I wouldn't smile. I, I think I would be feeling hurt and mistrustful and that's how I would act. I think that you need to be true to yourself. And if I loved someone and I believe they were lying to me and I believe there was a process they could take to get better and I knew they weren't taking it, smile would not be the way I would greet them when they came home. I would just say, I'm not really interested in much you have to say. I'm going to go take a yoga class, and that would be about it. And I wouldn't sleep in the same bed with them. By the way, if you don't try, uh, let me say this, Demi. A lot of you will say, well, I don't know whether to have trust with him or her. Here's the answer. Don't have sex with people you don't trust. When you were single and dating, you probably didn't have sex with someone until you trusted them, if you're not a sex addict. Um, don't have sex with us, even though you may be married to us, if you don't trust us. Um, I realize I need to develop a better morning routine that is working toward recovery because just waking up is super triggering for me. And the first thing I want to do is act out. What are some morning habits that successful <laughs> recoverers have? Or what are morning routines that keep you in recovery? Okay, so this is a great question. I'm going to assume this is a male. Yes. And so let me just tell you how men work. This is a little bit of our, about our operating system, our OS, if you will. Men release... Um, the most testosterone in our first half hour of waking. So we're primed to be, have an erection and be sexualized when we're waking up. Um, if you're a sex addict, this can be difficult because you're feeling aroused and you probably are aroused or if you're older, you're remembering when you used to get aroused and uh, that's a problem. So number one thing to do first thing in the morning, get out of bed. 
get out of bed. Don't lie there and think about things. Don't meditate about, get your butt out of bed, make the bed, put some clothes on or take a shower. If you're not lying around in your bed, you are less likely to act out. Once you're up, if your habit would be to go to porn or go to act out, then find a different habit. Find the habit of making, finding someone to call and saying, it's morning and this is usually when I struggle, so I'm checking in with you and you know, find that person at 12 step or whatever. So, and, or when you're on and say to them, I'll call you from the car. So in other words, try to set up some accountability for yourself, make yourself accountable to someone, put in a routine that is different than what you had, but most of all, get out of bed. It's people who lie in bed aroused and think, oh gosh, I know there must be something I can do to make this better. Just get up. <laughs> it's, it's like the alcoholic, just leave the bar. It just leave the bar. That's all it takes. I, I, I agree. And I have my morning routine and I, you know, go for a walk, go for a run, go do something. But yeah, I'm not sitting around um, uh, thinking about how much I wish I was doing whatever I'm not doing. So um, again, for me, I live in gratitude. So I'm always kind of focused on that. As a betrayed partner, I would also... Oh, this, I would also be most appreciative of your expertise as far as the likely reasons my essay husband would act out in our home and with many of our friends and acquaintances. I stopped because it's such a painful thing to respond to. And I was thinking about myself as an addict and knowing that it's funny, Tammy, we have certain lines that are silly, maybe, because after all the things we do, who cares? But my line was always, I never wanted to be sexual with someone else in my own home or in my own bed because I never wanted to bring that home to my partner. And interestingly, it sort of speaks to that question. I think that we all have different degrees of the ability to deny reality and denial is at the core of addiction. I can deny when I'm incredibly excited about something and really wanting to do it, that it's going to hurt anybody or it's going to be a problem at all. I can just push it out of my head. Um, I will say that people who set up situations that are more risky, are more shame inducing. I did it in my house. My wife could have caught me. There's probably more issues on that vine, whether that's trauma or rage or brokenness, because you are right to say, I believe and think about where is someone coming from who can let that happen in the same bed that I sleep with them in. It's sort of like the guy who can sit around and masturbate to porn while his kids are in the next room and he's supposed to be watching them. You know, there are some people who just like, well, if kids don't come in, I'm fine. And there's some people like, there's no way I could ever. And they are different people. But why this person is different, I don't know. In other words, the answer to your question could be, your husband is a sociopath. He has no feelings for other people. He's going to do whatever the hell he wants. And if it doesn't, and if it bothers you too much, you'll find another wife or another husband. It could also be that he was violently and horribly abused and doesn't have any sense of his own abuse or has no compassion for himself and little compassion for you, but that if you were to start working on this, there would be a lot of pain ahead for him, but a lot of growth. I can't answer that from here, but I cannot give a nod to yes, I think it is more concerning that it happened in and around your home with people that you know, because I can't say that it necessarily shows less caring for you, it could just mean that he is more trouble. But there's a lot of work to be done here. And when partners call and express that this has happened, you know, I, I, you know, I feel for them. That's a double betrayal because friends and acquaintances also were part of the betrayal. So, it, you know, it, to me, that feels like a double betrayal. So I, I also want to say, Tammy, that I think that someone, you know, if you're really, it, it, this is the kind of person who might do well in a treatment center. Um, because your amount of pain, your amount of struggle, whatever he's done, and you only know what he's telling you. Um, if you already know things that I would consider to be pretty upsetting like this, there might be more. Um, this is one of the things I think we do really well. And if you have an interest, right, now, right Tammy, but um, being in that kind of place that you talk about, I would want him or her to really get some expert help because there's a real line here. I don't know. I would need a lot of reassurance before I could let that person back into my heart and no less my bed. And I'm just not fully sure what's happening there. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, next question. Hello, I've been married for four years. Three months ago, I found out my husband has been addicted 
pornography since before I met him and I didn't know. He started this recovery journey thanks to this website. However, I don't know how much of the recovery or the addiction it's um, healthy for me to know. For example, if he watches pornography or masturbate, should I know? Or is that too much? He promised me that he would start being honest with me, but I'm not clear on how much I should know as a spouse because I'm scared the more I know, the more hurt I will be. The experience already hurt me so much that I'm starting to feel like I have depression and I'm scared of knowing more than I know. Also, I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to forgive him and that scares me because even after all of this pain, I deeply love him, but I lost my trust in him. Also, I would like to mention that since his recovery started, I feel like he's changing and getting better. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hear a lot of pain, but a lot of promise too. So that's it sounds good. like a young relationship to me is what mm -hmm. I hear. Um, and I do, so what I'm, what I'm not hearing, I'm gonna to speak to you, Tammy, rather than this person. What I'm not hearing in this story is a, um, a pathway, a, a template. Like I don't hear that there's a therapist involved or a 12 step program or, or the, even that, that he or she is stopping into some of our groups. And, and so I wanted to say to you that there needs to be some kind of path. Like, you're asking these questions, but you're kind of shooting in the dark. And I would imagine that maybe he is too. Um, in the world that I live in, yes. If he were to cross a bottom line boundary, like the, the thing that would most upset you, like he's back to looking at the porn and hiding it, he does need to tell you. He doesn't need to tell you if he thought about it. He doesn't need to talk to you if he talked to a friend about it. He doesn't need to tell you if he saw a Victoria's Secret billboard and thought, ooh, that's kind of like the porn I used to look at. But if he's looking at the porn, he does need to tell you because he'd gone back to where he was. and. But all of that should fit into some kind of process that is outside of both of you, where there are other people involved. So there are porn addiction meetings, there are sex addiction meetings, 12-step. There are non-12-step therapy groups. We have a drop-in group that's free. There are many places where he can get into and you can both get into some kind of structure. So that the, the, I think the kind of question that you're asking tells me that you need more support because it's the kind of question that most people would have answered in the beginning if they were involved, um, not just in a group like this, but maybe with another group of partners, or if your husband or spouse were going to 12-step. So uh, maybe what you might do, I wrote a book called Sex Addiction 101. You might read that. It talks about, and I don't, again, I, just for everybody, I make 12 cents when I sell a book because publishers make 99%. So just know that I sell books because, um, because I write them and I think what's in them is useful not to make money. But, um, but Sex Addiction 101 is a basic guide to what's going on. And it will, you know, it's a very basic guide to sex addiction. And in the book, I talk a lot about, you know, how do you approach a spouse and let them know? How much should you tell a spouse? What is the process where you begin to let each other know? And, and how do you find the help you need? All of that is in there. And I think that if you read up on the basics, it will give you a, a kind of a bigger framework for the kinds of questions you're asking. And you can always keep going and here, coming here and asking us. We appreciate it. Yeah, and, and Dr. David is on on Wednesday nights. I mean, there's a lot of different webinars where you can ask other um, clinicians for expertise, but also Dr. Rob mentioned the partner, betrayed partner with um, support group. So the next one is Wednesday morning or Wednesday at 1230 in the afternoon Pacific time for the general betrayed partner group. So, so check that out. That could be a really great support um, option for you as well. So that we're out of questions. We're a couple minutes early. So I guess we're going to, well, we have 22 people here tonight. Um, let me make a couple of announcements. Yeah. Um, what do I want to say, Tammy? Um, I want to say, oh, well, we have a couples workshop coming up that is almost full. I think we only have one more space one, for a couple. One spot for a couple December, when 13th is that? Through, December 13th through 15th. And we only have two spots for the January 17th through 19th uh, couples workshop. And so. those are for couples betrayal. We're also starting a couple of new workshops in January. One is for men who are working on early sexual recovery and just trying to figure it out. And that's a three-day intensive. And then we're also doing one for people who are struggling with sex and drugs or chemsex. And uh, that's also a three-day intensive with Dr. Fawcett. So what yeah. we're trying to do is create programming that is available, whether, you're free, whether it's free or it's a workshop or it's you know, a week or two weeks. We're trying to create levels of care that everybody can afford to find a way to, um, whether it's a free group or three weeks of care, um, we want to be available to help. So thanks, Tammy, for doing this tonight. And happy Thanksgiving. I hope everybody else had a happy Thanksgiving. Nice.
Did you? Did you? Ever I get did. I did. I was with uh, family, and uh, it was nice in Minnesota. Even though I froze, it was awesome to be with them. So I know I heard about Minnesota cute. all the way on the other side of the world because it snowed so darn it much. It snowed. It snowed. They closed schools. I they was keep like, mentioning Duluth. Twenty-six inches of yeah. Duluth. Fortunately, we were not that far north. We were down by the Twin Cities, so it was cold and snowy, but and not only fourteen like inches. Yes, exactly. So it's all good. Well, now that you're safely back in Arizona, and folks, I was in Singapore teaching overseas, and uh, and to those of you who might be visiting us from there, thank you for taking the time. We know that it's three in the morning for you. Do you know, Tammy? They come to this group at three in the morning. Yes, I do. It's really crazy, and we need yes. to. Maybe we can find an other side of the world support person to do something in the middle of our night. Well, and we do there. actually, actually, in some of the uh, some of the men's groups in particular are offered um, in Europe on a. Um, yeah, don't a, we have a guy in their, France? We do. So Gavin's group on Thursdays is in our morning um, Pacific time, but his evening. Right. So, so we right. do try to have some things that you know that work depending on which. And by the way, you're always welcome to suggest to us if there's a group that you want. Um, we listen. We got enough, enough requests for the old ladies posse. It's now happening. So if there's something you think, oh gosh, you know, for example, um, parents of sex addicts might be a group or, you know, whatever it is, we are glad to consider it and try to make it happen. If we can find someone to run it, we'll make it happen. And there was a new question. When are you going to be uh, continuing interviewing for podcasts? And that's on your radar, but he's been so busy lately that he's not been able to. Uh, so I have like 63 some... podcasts and this person is saying they've listened to all 63. I'm so, so grateful and sorry that I haven't done more, um, but I will do one this week. I promise. That would be great. Okay. Hey, and you know what I want to, I have two questions. Tammy, do people, do we ever get comments on the podcast? Do people comment? Oh, yeah. about, I never see any of that, but I hope that, I mean, I know they write us, but do they write on Lisbon or Spotify or Apple? I, that I, I guess I don't, I haven't we looked. We should find out. Um, I, I, I use Apple, so um, I can look on that. Like, um, do you ever write, do you ever listen to a uh, podcast? Like, oh, Joe, I really liked your podcast number seven, or is there a place to do that? Or Well, people do um, send comments through our systems. To and us, they right. will They will mention that they um, have found us on the podcast or they listen, sometimes they will know which one they listen to. So, so Good. I do see some of that information. Um, uh, somebody that called today mentioned the, they heard a, about us on the podcast. So, oh. so I do think it's good. Yeah. Do you want to type in the podcast which we brought it up and well, I we yeah. So the name best it or... way, no, but the best way to get to the podcast, the best way to get to any of our things is through um, our um, website. Seeking web, yeah. Yeah. So there it is. And you can um, click to go to any of the podcasts and there's podcasts. We've sorted them. So they're recommended for addicts they're recommended for couples or recommended for partners, LGBTQ. So th 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 we have them sort of organized now. So you sort of. No, I mean, well, I think we've done a really good job. They were just chaos. So well, I'll that, tell you that what, was the, one of the things that drove me crazy. So I was like, I'm fixing this. So one of the great things about podcasts too, is they, they index them. So you can hear, you can read like, they're talking about this at three minutes. They're talking about this at six minutes. So if there's a particular thing you want to get to, it's really pretty cool. I, I really like it. Anyway, thank you guys. We'll see you in, uh, I'll see you Friday on In the Rooms if you show up for me. Clients, I'm going to see you in a day or so. And Tammy, thank you as always for your help. Likewise. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.